government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. We can meet our destiny to build a land here that will be for all mankind a shining city on a hill. You're listening to the Liberty Brothers Radio Show, only on Revolution Radio. Now, here are your hosts, Jim White and Jason Van Tatenhove. Crusade for Freedom is your chance and mine to fight communism. Please hang up and try again. Hello, Liberty Brothers. How are you? We are doing hey, good. Hey, Ben, how are you doing? Doing let me, well. Uh, let me give you a proper introduction. Joining us on the line is Ben Davidson. Uh, ben is the director of the Mobile Observatory Project and the Suspicious Observers uh, YouTube channel. He has more than 200,000 subscribers to his daily news show, which covers weather, space weather, and planetary changes. His primary research produced the first mathematical algorithm to successfully correlate solar magnetic fields with earthquakes, and it will be featured presenter at the Conscious Life Expo in February 2015. Ben Davidson, thanks for joining us this afternoon on the Liberty Brothers. Very much a pleasure. How's it going? It's going real good. You know, I can barely even spit out the words of these uh, these technical uh, these technical terms, man. Some of your some of your videos are just knocking out of the park, and I have to admit to you, brother, I can't. As I said in the intro, some of these things are just a little bit above my head, above beyond my my comprehension. Uh, some of these terms that you use and some of this magnetic stuff. Uh, what what really got you into? How about this? Give us a little bit of your background and let us know what got you into, you know, getting involved in like uh, the weather, earthquakes, uh, sunspots, uh, solar flares, uh, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. And I'll, I'll try to make a long story fairly short. Uh, I'll start with the fact that I, I am assuming I can use the term awake here and people will know what I mean by that. We sure will. Uh, okay, excellent. So, um, after university, I went to law school, still sound asleep. Uh, and I figured out through a couple of internships that I didn't re really ever want to be a lawyer. Um, so what do you do when you've got a law degree and you don't want to be a lawyer? Well, the only other thing you're really trained to do is be an interdisciplinary researcher. Uh, but you are trained to do that for sure. Um, nobody can memorize every law. They basically just teach you how to be presented with a complex question or problem, go down and uh, go hunt down the answers wherever you can find them. You run across a word or a topic you don't fully understand, you stop what you're doing and you go research that other topic until you feel like you're an expert on it. And so I went to work doing uh, interdisciplinary research for an investment firm. Um, yippee, I was making rich people richer. And um, I just sort of woke up right around the time that the Japan uh, tsunami occurred. My wife and I both woke up together. And I decided, uh, since I started looking for answers uh, to a lot of questions that I had on the internet, uh, and found that it was really, really hard to discern between what was good information, who was fear mongering, who was just trying to put a fancy title to a video or article so they could get clicks. And so I figured, wait a minute, this is what I'm trained to do. Why don't I just do this? And so uh, I started off, uh, you know, many different forays down conspiracy alleys and uh, a lot of other uh, government watchdog stuff. You know, our our boys in charge don't always, our, I should say our boys and girls in charge don't always do what they're supposed to do and somebody should be suspicious of them. And then right at that exact time, I had a couple of friends uh, that I had made uh, when I was at Penn State who had actually moved up through the ranks of uh, meteorology, so to speak, and they were doing a lot of the grunt work for the IPCC reports, uh, you know, the people that get to put their names on these big government reports and other big papers, oftentimes only did a fraction of the work. Most of the time it's just their grad students and postdocs. Well, a lot of times these were my friends, and they were telling me how corrupted the IPCC was, um, how... Uh, most of the weather changes on the planet were driven by the sun and that the sun was about to go to sleep, so to speak, and we're going to be getting, uh, we, we will still have hot events on the planet, but the storms and the cold events are going to be what's really dangerous. And so I started looking into all of these things, uh, including how our Earth's poles have begun to shift and our magnetosphere has begun to fade. And uh, 
pretty much just ran with it from there. Before I knew it, I looked down and there was 100,000 subscribers to the YouTube channel. Decided it was about time I quit my uh, I quit making rich people richer, and now we're about double that, and we're going strong. Wow. Um, so you really just, this has been a very quick uh, ride for you so far. I mean, you, you said you just woke up during the uh, Japanese uh, uh, tidal wave, right? Yeah, well, actually, literally and figuratively. Um, in case any of your viewers don't know, uh, the little bit of backstory here, uh, every day since 2011, I've done that morning news show for the Suspicious Observers. And when I say every day, I don't take weekends off. I don't take holidays off. The day after I got married, Christmas, Easter, my mom's birthday, it doesn't matter. If the earth is turning and the sun comes up, my news show will come out at 6 or 6.30 a.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Wow, that, that's a dedication because I know I was up till 1.30, you know, most <laughs> nights this, this weekend just trying to get this one video out. Uh, yeah. using some new motion graphics and uh, boy I did it's, take some time off <laughs> it's not always easy it's not always easy but I do enjoy it but where I was going with that was uh, um, on March 11th 2011 my wife and I both woke up very early in the morning uh, I think it was about 345 uh, best I can guess and we couldn't figure out why we were so awake uh, we both looked at each other and realized we had both kind of woken up from a deep sleep and neither one of us is ready to go back to bed so what do you do you turn on the television and the you know the earthquake had happened and we're watching the tsunami crest over Honshu and so now every morning I wake up at that same time right around 3:45 to start preparing the news each day so it was both a literal and a figurative uh, wake up uh, that day back in 2011 so you, you had talked a little bit about that the, the sun is going to be going down, kind of going into a cold uh, season. And, and I've read other articles about this, talking about how the sunspot activity is going to decrease fairly dramatically, and we're just kind of starting this cycle. Can you talk a little bit about that and what that means for us and, and our weather and our, our weather patterns specifically? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I could get really complex with this, but the basics of it are this. There is an 11-year solar sunspot cycle where the sunspots really ramp up and then they kind of fade back down and there's not much activity. But there's a longer cycle as well, the solar grand cycle. And this is about 400 years. And during each one of these 400 years, uh, approximately, we have a solar grand maximum and a solar grand minimum. The last solar grand minimum was about 400 years ago. Uh, that's what we're about to go into again now. And that was the end of the mini ice age and the worst part of the mini ice age where most of the famines, the droughts or severe flooding in other areas took place. Um, other kind of uh, mass diseases, uh, civil chaos, things like that. And then uh, after about 50 to 70 years of that solar grand minimum, which is called the Maunder minimum, um, they, uh, the sunspot began increasing slowly in activity. And then right around 1930 or 1940, it really began ramping up. And uh, the highest solar activity of this grand cycle of the last 400 years was from the mid-1900s up to the mid-1990s. And based on some past reconstruction they do with ice cores, um, tree rings, and other geological data points, they think that this solar grand maximum was actually the largest uh, solar grand maximum and most enduring, basically the highest solar activity for thousands of years. And what do you know, it happened to be right during the time of, quote, global warming. But sometime uh, about 15 to 20 years ago, the sun really began weakening. And this drop-off uh, has been characterized by one uh, solar physicist as the the fastest drop-off in solar activity that they can track back even, you know, all the way through their reconstructed data, about 9,000 years. And the quote was that the sun is now weakening faster than at any time in the last 9,300 years. And the starting point for that is pretty much right on point with the, um, the starting moment of the so-called global warming pause. I don't know how familiar your listeners are with that, but if you were to just Google global warming pause or IPCC admits no global warming, uh, global temperatures actually kind of plateaued about 
17 or 18 years ago. And if you, uh, depending on what point you pick uh, between then and now, the planet has actually cooled slightly. And, um, you know, they're kind of racing, scrambling to figure out why this was the case, especially as CO2 and other greenhouse gases have been skyrocketing exponentially through the roof. Um, we think that the sun is a much better uh, meter for this. And the sun has continued to show its weakening trend. And um, at this point, there's pretty much no doubt about what's what's in our future on our star. You see, Ben and I always thought Al Gore was responsible for this cooling period. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, is it just a matter of time? I see some of your videos and I see some of these and I know the videos don't do nearly do it justice. But I think some of these some of these solar flares that come off the sun are probably larger than the Earth, I bet, or at oh, least that size. I mean, is it just a matter of time before? I know we just got a near miss, I want to say, a couple of years ago. It just came out maybe um, two or three months ago, and you're probably very acutely aware of it, where we just had like a near miss apparently in 2012, I want to say. Right. Uh, are, you, are you thinking it's a matter of time before we get walloped with one of these things? Yes, and that's that's the interesting thing. We've got, uh, we've got this long-term downward trend of the sun, but it can still fire off at any time. The largest solar flare we've ever known of happened during a very weak solar cycle, very unexpected. Um, two of the largest solar flares of the last decade happened during the, solar sun, the last solar sunspot minimum when there are supposed to be less flares. So these single eruptive events don't seem to care what the long-term trend of the sun is doing, and they'll just happen whenever they're going to happen. Speaking of that 2012 uh, near kill shot miss, I thought it was funny because uh, when it actually occurred, I was telling folks, hey, I, I think we're really lucky that this thing wasn't fired in our direction. This thing was huge. And it took literally two years for NASA to come out and uh, say the exact same thing. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of the folks that watch the show found that pretty amusing as well. Now, do you think, real quick, do you think NASA's holding that information back? Obviously, they've got, you know, they, they know what's going on, but why would it take them two years? Are they just trying to keep people from panicking? What, what, what would be the logic there? We know NASA uh, keeps a whole lot from us, that's for sure. Well, that is true. Um, I think that the reasoning, uh, and, you know, they made mention of the solar flare back when it happened, uh, but they didn't sort of characterize it as they did uh, in, you know, just a couple of months ago. It was actually July uh, when, when they characterized the this flare as being one of the ones that could have, you know, basically thrown the Earth back into a, the Stone Age. I think it was because the sun was starting to ramp up with, with more solar flares, and they're really pushing this new, um, you know, they're really pushing awareness of space weather. Uh, NASA is having some trouble with their budget, which, by the way, happened uh, right around the same time they began to prove things that uh, prove global warming, uh, at least anthropogenic global warming, a little bit incorrect. Uh, all of a sudden, they, they lose half their funding. Um, there's really nobody else you can fund when it comes to studying this, uh, uh, this stuff. And so they're really, they're really trying to push hard um, in the public eye the topic of space weather, of solar events, um, just as a way to get programs funded, and because it is fairly important that people understand what space weather is and how it affects Earth. Uh, there have been a number of major events uh, on this planet that have been caused by the sun, and I don't just mean throughout history. I mean, within the last 150 years or so, there have been significant events. I'm talking planes going down, buildings catching on fire, satellites going down, GPS going down, affecting aircraft, trying to land. Uh, it's a very significant issue, and it will continue to be significant, uh, especially as Earth's magnetics are rapidly, rapidly changing at the moment. Now, is the, the Earth magnetics changing specifically due to what we're seeing happening in our atmosphere? Do you think, do you attribute it to, you know, man-made issues, whether it be, you know, weather modification or, um, you know, what they would term geoengineering? Um, or is it something different? Is it just a, a natural cycle? The Earth's magnetics are probably just a natural cycle. Um, I want to 
clarify, I do believe that they are um, trying to modify the weather just a little bit, maybe more than a little bit, uh, and that includes spraying some things in the sky. Uh, but we also can't forget that uh, one of the best evidences we have that our you know, that the sun is really going down into this period is that every single planet is experiencing major climate change right now. And in fact, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus are all experiencing far greater changes than Earth is. And um, I have to attribute that to the experts knowing what's coming and them trying to mitigate it. Now, before anyone thinks for a moment, I think that it's a good idea that they're doing that. I absolutely do not. The last time the sun did this was the 1600s and people that looked like me crossed the Atlantic and made, you know, 13 colonies. Stuff gets done. It's not the end of the world. They don't need to be playing God in the sky. They don't need to be uh, spraying aluminum oxides, poisoning the ground so that only Monsanto's uh, aluminum resistant crops will grow. There's a lot of ugly angles to the current geoengineering uh, paradigm. But, you know, Earth's magnetic changes, those are even a a separate issue from all of this. When the sun did this 400 years ago and 400 years before that, Earth's magnetosphere, our magnetic shield, our protective interface with energy from space was quite strong. And our magnetic poles were quite stable. But that all changed about, you know, depending on where you actually pinpoint it, anywhere from 100 to 200 years ago. And right now, Earth's poles are indeed shifting, and the magnetosphere is losing quite a bit of strength. We're about 15 to 20 percent down on our protective shield. And it, it can very much be thought of, you know, in, in, in like a Star Trek sense, you know, raise the shields kind of stuff, uh, except there's not, you know, some spaceship firing at Earth. It's the sun, and it's constant. So what... What, what does it mean when you say that the, the, the poles are shifting? I mean, is that going to be a catastrophic event when that happens, or is it – what does that mean exactly? Well, we, we hope that uh, – and when I say we, I mean anybody who doesn't really have a death wish. Um, we really hope that this is just kind of a blip on the radar. Uh, and it is possible that that is the case. You know, the, the magnetic poles of Earth go through these little – cycles where they will be stable for a while and then they'll start trekking around the polar regions and they do not always result in a full magnetic reversal or a pole flip however what we do know is that when it is a full reversal event it will be accompanied by a weakening of the magnetosphere and that is precisely what we see now we have both ingredients you know the poles have started to shift their shift appears to be hastening. That is to say it is um, <clears throat> speeding up faster and faster. And the same can be said with Earth's magnetosphere weakening. It is weakening faster and faster and faster. And recently the ESA, the European Space Agency, basically Europe's version of NASA, just came out and said that Earth's magnetosphere is weakening because the poles are shifting. And of course to abate uh, panic and fear. They said, oh, but don't worry, this takes hundreds or thousands of years to occur. And it was only a few weeks ago where uh, a couple of researchers from Berkeley, and uh, if you know anything about Berkeley, those are big boys and girls over there, they don't play around. They said that these magnetic shifts can occur within about 80 years' time. And the poles really started kicking into gear about 100 years ago. We're already past the minimum threshold of time it can take. Earth's magnetosphere technically started weakening in the 1600s, but um, it's really sort of ramped up since about, 1850, uh, about 1850 or 1860, and it really started speeding up right around the year 2000. So we've got both of these things happening right now, and these things leave us much more vulnerable to space weather, these large solar events much more vulnerable. Ben, you know, someone had, uh, someone had uh, brought to my attention, and I don't remember where, and I could probably look it up. Someone had talked to me about the Schumann resonance. Uh, are you familiar with that term when I say that? Absolutely. Um, they they well, say okay. it's speeding up. I, uh, real quick, they say that apparently it's speeding up and it's, 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 it's resonating faster and faster than it ever has been recorded before 
is what I was the report that I received. Uh, is that accurate as far as you know? Um, in a way, yes. The the Schumann resonance is basically the uh, then there's actually multiple Schumann resonances. They are these resonances of the planet Earth, Earth's atmosphere, and they're pretty much caused by lightning. There are, you know, lightning strikes all over the planet that truly follow a frequency. And it's not just one. There is a, there is a main Schumann resonance, uh, but there are actually a couple of Schumann resonance peaks. And those have been changing, uh, not a ton, but they have indeed been changing a bit which really sort of signals that there's something energetic that is changing the planet rather than chemical. And what I mean by that is we get our energy, all of our energy, from the sun. And if it was chemical, that would be things like pollution or geoengineering, uh, you know, chemtrails, solar radiation management, whatever you want to call it, which I also happen to think is a form of pollution. Um, and so we have, we have at the heart of this, right, and that's kind of a, a nice way to say it, because the Schumann resonances can be thought of as the heartbeat of our atmosphere, of our planet. Uh, they are changing a bit, and there's only one way that can happen. That has to be an energetic change. Well, um, <clears throat> one of the things that I've heard about and I wanted to ask you about was the... Oh. Oh, I think I am I back on. Yep, we are. Uh, sorry about that. I must have. Uh, I must have uh, hit the. Uh, hit the uh, I don't know. Yeah, we lost one of you guys for a yeah, second. I mean, you okay, know, we're back. And, uh, you don't want to hear it, but I'm getting used to this new microphone here, and I'm. And I'm it's got me all in a tizzy, and I can't get it all. I can't get it figured out. Uh, at any rate, it's been a very long time since I heard somebody successfully use the word tizzy in a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm assuming you think. Uh, by your response, it was successful because I don't use it very often. I have to admit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, we'll get back to the question real quick. Um, ben, I, I wanted to ask you. Um, part of this uh, this plan they seem to have with the geoengineering seems to be that they're making the atmosphere not inert anymore, but that it's able to conduct much better. And I was wondering what sort of ramifications that might actually uh, have. Um. Well, there's a, you know, like I said, I think that there's a couple of different things at play here with geoengineering. Uh, first of all, despite the fact that I think that it's a terrible idea in just about every way, including the fact that they don't really understand the long-term effects of it, um, I do think that they love this game that they're playing. That, and I, by this game, I mean this economic, geopolitical game that they have been winning for decades and decades and decades. And they don't really want that game to stop. They, they like their game. Um, and so they're trying to stave off these major global disruptive disasters as long as possible. They're also trying to make it harder for some nations to watch ground movement, uh, especially large military movements. I'm sure you guys have heard people talking about the large convoys going across the country. They're moving things here. They're moving people there. Well, if you create a lot of extra cloud cover, not only can do you not have a visual of the ground, but if you've laced it with uh, aluminum oxides or, or you know other stuff that would be in chemtrails, there's no cloud penetrating radar that's going to work either. In terms of um, making the atmosphere more conductive and things like that, um, that is something that occurs. I know that they're probably trying to block out some of the solar radiation. Um, for example, like I said, we've lost 15 to 20 percent of our magnetosphere. You take that number down to 50, you better not go outside at noon. You better not. And um, I, I would think about what I would do if I was in their position. And I had two choices. I could try to mitigate it by spraying stuff in the sky or... I could tell everyone not to go outside at noon and explain to them why they can't go outside at noon and pray that they don't panic and have a run on the banks, a run on the grocery stores, the gas stations, and all of that, and basically society collapses overnight. But getting back to specifically what you said, and 
uh, about the conductivity of the atmosphere, and this ties back into what I was saying about how they have already begun weather modification and geoengineering, and this just does make it a little bit easier. Um, how much easier? That's tough to say. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that, um, if I can be so bold, they kind of suck at weather modification thus far. Uh, <laughs> it would seem. For example, you know, cloud seeding is the most successful form of weather modification. It's been around since before Vietnam. The number one cloud seeding group in the world claims only a 50% success rate at creating any change in rainfall. Now, with ionospheric heaters, with scalar waves and things like that, they can push uh, they can push weather around a little bit. They may even be able to strengthen or weaken it. Um, but for example, uh, you'll hear people on the internet talking about, uh, oh, you know, they made a tornado here or they made a hurricane there. They simply can't do that. There's, I mean, take a small tornado and you're talking about multiple nuclear bombs worth of power. Um, there's no way to create that or trigger that just by pulsing some beams up into the sky. But they are screwing with the weather and uh, unfortunately, there's no way to throw a tiny wrench into a big engine and not hope for an all-out stall event. And I think it's only a matter of time before their, their playing God in the sky really comes back to bite us all in the behind. You know, Ben, let's talk about earthquakes for a second. Uh, to me, it seems that, that earthquakes are, are – maybe it's just uh, because the news uh, – the coverage is better – but it seems to me that earthquakes are on the rise. Uh, is there any correlation, do you find, with this whole sun activity and the earthquake activity? Is there any, uh, any correlation between those two from your research? Mathematically certain, yes. Um, you know, we have found uh, space weather triggers for earthquakes, and uh, this probably works for volcanoes as well, although we haven't technically done the statistical analysis on that yet. But we can pretty much just say that works. And this goes for a number of different uh, events that happen on the sun and happen in the solar wind interacting with the Earth. And all of these things are modulated or mitigated, if you will, by our magnetosphere. And as it fades, we are left more and more open to energy from space. And this is definitely causing an increase in all these activities. Uh, true enough, the number of monitoring stations on the planet for earthquakes has gone up. And yes, news has begun to cover it a lot more, and news coverage has been more widespread, global even, but not to the extent uh, of the actual increase we are seeing. That is far greater than our increase in monitoring or reporting. So I would, I would have to say definitely yes, um, without a doubt. Well, do you see, uh, you know, we had, uh, we had an expert on uh, last week that was talking about uh, fracking. Uh, mm -hmm. That, of course, um, you know, I think it depends uh, and on what research that you read, whether it's uh, harmful or not harmful. Um, and not necessarily much the ground, not necessarily the groundwater problem, because I know that's probably not your area, but more the, more the earthquake uh, uh, situation. Do you think uh, fracking is uh, detrimental to that, or do you think it's really not that big of a deal? It's not causing uh, earthquakes, or you know, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I certainly think it has caused some earthquakes. Um, I don't believe it has ever been blamed on an earthquake larger than 4.0, and I don't believe anybody has ever been injured in an earthquake that has been attributed to fracking. Um, I tend to take a devil's advocate approach to a lot of these things that I hear on the internet. And uh, sometimes it proves fruitful, and other times I just sort of prove the other guys made a good point. When it comes to fracking, um, on one hand, they took the negative press of the last decade or two very, very seriously. I have a friend who works for Entero, which is a huge, huge fracking company worth billions. Uh, and he says that half their discussions are about safety. And he tells me some of the things that, that they've done in the last decade or so to improve safety. And it has improved greatly. Has it improved to the point where I'd let them frack on my property? Absolutely not. Um, but uh, so it, it's sort of a there's two sides to that story. 
whether or not it is detrimental long term. You know, there's there's some, an interesting thing that's been going on on this planet. Um, you know, the Ring of Fire, which circles the Pacific Ocean, it's where most of the earthquakes take place. The most seismically active place in the world is California in terms of earthquake occurrence, but many of them are tiny. It also happens that California and the west coast of the United States is really the only part of the Ring of Fire that hasn't had a major earthquake in a very long time. I mean, we had one in New Zealand. We've had a bunch down near Antarctica. We had a huge one in Chile in 2010, uh, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, of course, Japan in 2012. Uh, we've even had an eight-pointer up in the Kuril Islands of, Ala uh, of you know, near Russia. But the United States and Canada haven't had a big one, and yet they've had tiny little pressure releases every day, more than anywhere else in the world. Uh, this isn't directly related to fracking, but there was a massive, well, there still is a massive tar volcano in the Gulf of Mexico, and there was some quiet worry that it was going to go, that it was going to blow, that it was going to pollute not just the Gulf, but the entire Atlantic. And when it went, it was going to set off New Madrid as well and create that situation from the U.S., uh, the future map of the United States from the U.S. Navy, where, you know, water comes up through half the United States. That would that could be triggered by a tar volcano going off in the Gulf of Mexico. Luckily, somebody drilled a hole into it and released all the pressure. But of course, nobody talks about that aspect of it. They just talk about how bad the oil spill was. It's very possible that all the fracking that's been going on has released a lot of pressure from New Madrid. It's possible that the lubrication, the oils and the gases that would have allowed the slip of the tectonic, uh, of the tectonic regions has been relieved, and maybe we've bought 100 years or 200 years. Is this certain? I don't know. But if we are going to be seeking truth, which I think most folks who are awake, there's that, you know, there's that one thing we can agree on. We're all looking for the truth this somehow. We have to at least entertain these ideas as well. So um, well, like I said, I, I wouldn't let somebody frack on my property. Uh, whether or not it is 100% a bad thing, I, uh, I, I couldn't say. Well, there's certainly interesting uh, points of view there, especially on the volcano and the release of pressure. That's uh, something I had not thought of yet. So, uh, definitely uh, cool stuff. So, let's talk about the weather. Um, we we've obviously seen uh, a very intense. Uh, it it I, technically it's not in the winter yet, and we're seeing you know snowfall records being broken. You know, hundred year records being broken and and. Um, the the east coast northern northeastern United States uh, here in Montana we've seen just a, a lot of very very cold weather and some more snow than I I would normally would assume we'd see at this time of year but it seems like it's happening everywhere at the same time we see California seeing droughts uh, and weather patterns that they've they've never seen really before um, can can you comment about the weather and what's going on there what what's what's the big deal there what's going on well the big deal there is that um, there's a number of changes taking place on the planet. Some are due to the sun, some are due to Earth's magnetic changes. And these things are causing uh, what should be termed as climate extremes. Um, if the sun, if and when the sun fully goes to sleep again, which it has not completely done yet, um, there's a good chance that we'll be in for a long period of cooling. But until that happens, we are in for these extreme swings back and forth, seeing all different kinds of extreme weather. You know, I bet it's been cold in Montana, but this morning people in New Mexico woke up to, you know, temperatures in the teens, and that's pretty low for them. Um, I think South Carolina hadn't seen, uh, this one part of South Carolina hadn't seen snow before November 8th or 9th in the history of records. And then on November 1st, they got 16 inches. That's a heck of a way to break that record. And what we're seeing is these shifts back and forth, hot and cold, drought and flood, um, massive tornado outbreaks one year, and then the next year it seems like not so many tornadoes. Horrible hurricanes from the Atlantic you know, for a few years. And then the last two years, we haven't seen as much from the Atlantic other than, you know, Sandy. So we have this, 
the situation taking place on Earth right now, um, actually, I'm going to back up a step. The last 200 years or so have been uh, from all the evidence you can gather, whether that's geological, whether that's uh, some other form of environmental evidence, or you go on the historical accounts of our ancestors. This has been one of the quietest and calmest 200 to 300 years that this planet has ever seen, at least, at least in known history. And the fact of the matter is, this planet, most of the time, throughout most of its history, does things that are crazy enough to make our ancestors event, uh, invent stories of capricious and jealous gods doing battle in the sky. You know, they weren't idiots. These people could predict eclipses, and they mapped, the, uh, they mapped with great accuracy the movement of the planets. These were diligent mathematicians and astronomers. So why did they come up with these crazy stories? It's because the Earth threw stuff at them that they couldn't even believe. And yes, we've been lucky to sort of have this surge in our civilization over the last two to three hundred years, but the Earth won't stay like that forever, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the planet Earth is going back into one of these chaotic phases right now. Uh, ben, are you there? I'm here. Okay, I was, I was, I was losing you. I think I was losing you a little bit on my mic. Uh, you know, I, Ben, being awake, I can ask you this question because, you know, we, we've established the fact what it means to be awake. You, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, David Icke. You probably mm-hmm. heard of David Icke, I'm sure. You know, yeah. I heard him, I heard a, I heard him uh, give a presentation, and he talked about the moon being, being hollow. And, of course, anytime you hear that stuff, I mean, you're, you know, the old filter that in, your, in the world that we lived in uh, previous to being woke up immediately says, that's crazy. But, hey, I went to, I went to, I went to NASA's website. And they said on NASA's own website, I want to say somewhere like maybe 92, um, an asteroid or meteorite hit the moon and it rang, in their words, it rang like a bell for 30 minutes, like it was hollow. Well, uh, you know, that, hap- that, that happened. What do you think about that? That happened when they put the lander down there. And, you know, let's, let's you know, put aside for a second the questions of did they send humans to the moon? Because for certain they sent at least probes to the moon. There's that there's that mirror in the sea of uh, tranquility that you if you have a powerful enough laser, you can actually bounce a laser beam off that mirror on the moon and bounce it back to you. It's one of the only physical proofs we have that we've ever actually been there. Um, and when they put that first lander down, the moon rang. So it wasn't just the asteroid. When when we have landed stuff on the moon, it rang like a bell. Um, whether that has something to do with the makeup, the, the composition of the moon, um, or whether or not it's hollow, I can't say for certain. I do know that that evidence points to there being at least some hollow shell of the moon. And um, I think that there's a lot of evidence for that. Um, now, what that means... Yeah, what um, does that mean? I mean, that's just... I mean, just think about that. I mean, Well, you know, here's the thing. There's probably hollow shells of Earth. There's probably hollow shells of the sun. This is um, this is probably uh, once it's all said and done, something that they're going to find is fairly ubiquitous in these uh, sphere magnet objects in the universe. And when I say a sphere magnet, I mean any object big enough to, over time, make itself into a sphere, and would otherwise be spinning. I know the moon is tidally locked, and so it doesn't really spin relative to Earth, but um, it would otherwise be spinning, uh, were it not. And so I think it's very likely that all these sphere magnets, stars, planets, moons, have some hollow areas within them. Uh, knowing what little I know of, uh, of David, he, he, he's probably suggesting that there's aliens inside there monitoring us, uh, reptiles to be, to be specific. Uh, I don't know about any of that, but um, I, I would have to agree that there's almost certainly – at least one hollow shell in the moon. You know, Ben, if you look at, when you look at all, if I can ask you one more question real quick, sorry to cut you off, Jason. If I don't know, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, um, the, the, uh, ancient aliens and those type of things with, uh, uh, Eric von Daniken and all the stuff they, they find, uh, all yes. these ancient artifacts, but that stuff to me is just absolutely amazing because I mean, you know, I wasn't around back then, but I know that you had to have a certain level of intelligence to do some of these things that they did. 
I mean, do you see uh, our ancestors? They seem to have a, a tremendous grasp on the universe and interstellar travel and things like that. Uh, do you find that in your research that the ancients had a had a a lot more knowledge, perhaps, than we give them credit for when it comes to those type of things? Absolutely, and I think that every point that they give to that they say, "Oh, and see this. This is definite evidence of aliens." I think that they should also question whether or not there were past great human civilizations that were capable of these things. Um, I think it's possible that based on where uh, our magnetosphere is right now in terms of strength, based on where the sun is in relation to a potential binary star that it might have, there may be some impediments to our current brain activity. And the earth was certainly different back then. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but you know, dinosaurs couldn't be here today. They would be crushed under their own weight. There was something different about the planet that allowed them to flourish. Uh, the planet either had to have had less gravity uh, or you know, some kind of less interaction with that, or dinosaurs were completely aquatic. And I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest they were not completely aquatic. So um, Earth has changed and people have changed. Um, whether or not there was an actual city called Atlantis that sank is irrelevant. Uh, the fact of the matter is that, you know, we know about five or 6,000 years ago, humans couldn't really do a whole lot. But 17,000 years ago, they were able to bury Gobekli Tepe, a highly sophisticated city, under 50 feet of sand. Uh, they created a 50-foot sand dune. Um, and they can tell it was buried on purpose. We find uh, ruins of ancient cities 150 feet under the water, 300 feet under the water. I think it's very, very possible that humans have been on this planet a lot longer than we're given credit for. And, um, you know, if you just take this current round of civilization um, and look at it like that, You'd have to come to the conclusion that aliens did something. But um, I think it's very possible that there were great human civilizations of the past that had vast knowledge of all of these things. Uh, and don't forget, some of those ancient cultures that talked about people visiting from the stars described men in white beards coming down. So, um, you know, uh, I mean, e even the uh, alleged Anunnaki looked like giant humans. So... Um, well, Ben, let me ask you this. Are you wanting to stay on through the second hour with us, or did you we just have uh, one first hour scheduled out? If so, we'd like to give you time because we're coming up on our hard break to give out your websites, YouTube channels, things like that. If you want to stay on for the second hour, we'd love to have you, but we understand your time is precious, so uh, let us know I what would, you'd like to I would love to come back sometime. Unfortunately, I don't know if you guys know this, but my wife is pregnant with our first child. Well, and Congratulations. Uh, things I have to attend to over here. I would love to come back sometime and uh, definitely would love to answer any last minute questions if you guys have them. Well, my, my last question would be, you, you seem to have so much knowledge of what's going on and there's so many big possible storms heading our way. In your opinion, what's the biggest thing that's got you worried? Um, heading into another mini ice age. Uh, I don't know how uh, how long it would take for the Earth's magnetic changes to to happen. If they did happen, uh, we are back in the Stone Age immediately, and uh, society as we know it is gone. Uh, I'm much more certain that the sun is going to sleep, and that's going to cause absolutely um, devastating effects on this planet. Uh, we're going to see terrible terrible winter conditions. We're going to see terrible droughts, terrible floods in other areas. Uh, there will be a summer in the not-too-distant future where the Great Lakes don't unfreeze. We'll get a snowstorm from Texas to the Dakotas, and some states won't be able to grow anything that year. The United States, uh, you know, the U.S. won't export food that year, and we feed the world. Ben, uh, we're going to come over right on our time at any time. Give out your websites, please, uh, YouTube channel, things like that, so people can learn more about you. Sure thing, sure thing. Um, YouTube, Suspicious Observers. Uh, the website is suspiciousobservers.org, and we're going around the country in the Mobile Observatory, and you can check that out at observatoryproject.com. Awesome. Are you coming through Montana anytime soon? 
We already went through Montana, my friend, but uh, we may be back. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. It was uh, great talking to you. Love your perspectives. And, uh, yeah, we'll definitely have you back on again sometime soon. Terrific, guys. Hope you have a good one. All right. Thanks, Ben. Happy thanks for joining us. See ya. All right. There you go. Ben Davidson from uh, Suspicious Observers and the Mobile Observatory Project. You are listening to the Lemmy Brothers Radio Show because freedom is important.